Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Bristol Festival of Ideas and this final lecture in our, in the first Coleridge Lecture Series. We're delighted to have so many people here tonight and thank you all for your support through this series. And thanks also, and particularly to the University of Bristol and the Cabot Institute for their support and Rich Pankos. They've been great partners in this whole venture. And I think this, if you've attended many of the events in this series, the Romantic Poets Evening, the Nature Writing Day and some of the other lectures, uh, I hope you'd agree, certainly the feedback we've had is this has been a fantastic series and we're looking forward already to doing it again next year. One of the things we were very keen to look at, and we're also looking at this later on in the year as well in, in our final project in Bristol 2015, the Festival of the Future City, is about nature and the city. And when I was reading uh, Melissa Harrison's work, her first novel, Clay in particular, but also some of her articles, and following a very entertaining tweeting, as authors are very good at these days, I thought this is the kind of person we really wanted in this series, particularly on this subject. Melissa, uh, some may know, writes for the Times, the, the Nature Column, reviews the Times Literary Supplement, and is the author of two novels, Clay and now in Hawthorne, at Hawthorne time, which hasn't quite come out yet, but if you want to read it, we've got advanced copies tonight as well. Melissa's going to talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have the usual questions and discussion. So thank you very much for coming along. Would you welcome Melissa Harrison? Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, one of the most surprising things about writing a book is that all of a sudden you get asked to speak at all sorts of events, some of which are more relevant to what you're working on and thinking about than others. But every so often one comes along that's such a good fit that it becomes a pleasure from start to finish. And that's really how I feel about being here today to deliver the last of these Coleridge lectures. Tonight's talk is going to be in two parts. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about uh, cities in recent history, um, how they've evolved and how they're still evolving. And then I'm going to read you a story. Um, I'm a novelist and that's what I do best. And uh, the story is going to take you through 24 hours in the urban jungle. And when I'm doing that, please feel free to daydream. Because I think daydreaming is a very powerful and perhaps even a radical act. But not in this first bit. <laughs> Shelley writing at the very height of the Romantic movement, said, hell is a city much like London. As he wrote, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing, scarring, or so it seemed, the landscape of Britain and driving a sudden and shocking wave of urbanisation. Poets, painters and philosophers turned to nature to find meaning and respite from the march of progress, which had become so swift and so seemingly annihilating. A strong vein of romantic anti-urbanism was set up, which painted the countryside as natural, the city as unnatural. 200 years later, it's a belief we're still struggling to shake off. The new factory system concentrated employment in particular areas, as vast numbers of people sought work in manufacturing and heavy industry. By 1851, the urban population in England exceeded the rural population, the first time this had ever happened anywhere. The industrial cities of the north exploded into growth. Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds and Sheffield grew by more than 40% between 1821 and 1841. Bradford by 65%. By 1881, two out of every five people lived in the six huge built-up areas of London, South East Lancashire, the West Midlands, West Yorkshire, Merseyside and Tyneside. And by the end of the 19th century, three quarters of the population lived in towns and cities. And the process reached far beyond Britain. Paris, Naples, Vienna, Berlin, Rome, St. Petersburg, Budapest and Moscow all ballooned in this period. The true metropolis went from a rarity, an aberration, to something like the norm. And almost overnight, Britain became a nation of town dwellers. Today, the persistence of a rural idyll in our idea of nationhood proves that urbanisation was a shock from which we've not yet imaginatively recovered. Eric Hobsbawm, in his famous book, Industry and Empire, described the newly populous cities of the Industrial Revolution like this. It was not merely that smoke hung over them and filth impregnated them, 
that the elementary public services, water supply, sanitation, street cleaning, open spaces and so on, could not keep pace with the mass migration of men into cities, thus producing epidemics of cholera, typhoid and the appalling constant toll of air pollution and water pollution. It was not merely that the new city populations, sometimes entirely unused to non-agrarian life, were pressed into overcrowded and bleak slums. Nor was it simply the steely, unplanned concentration of those who built them on utility and financial profit, and which built endless rows of houses and warehouses, cobbled streets and canals, but neither fountains nor public squares, promenades nor trees. But more than this, the city destroyed society. The city was a volcano to whose rumblings the rich and powerful listened with fear and whose eruptions they dreaded. But for its poor inhabitants, it was a stony desert which they had to make habitable by their own effort. These toxic and alienating places were not slow to appear in literature and art. For Blake, the idea of the city was famously apocalyptic, the polar opposite of England's green and pleasant land. Dickens famously modelled the horrifyingly grim coke town in Hard Times on Preston in Lancashire. And here he is in Dombey and Son, published in 1848. She often looked with compassion at such a time upon the stragglers who came wandering into London by the great highway hard by and who, footsore and weary and gazing fearfully at the huge town before them as if foreboding that their misery there would be but as a drop of water in the sea or as a grain of sea sand on the shore went shrinking on, swallowed up in one phase or other of its immensity towards which they seemed impelled by a desperate fascination, they never returned. Food for the hospitals, the churchyards, the prisons, the rivers, fever, madness, vice, and death, they passed on to the monster roaring in the distance and were lost. Wordsworth may have praised London in his sonnet composed upon Westminster Bridge, but he was describing the capital when it was utterly deserted at dawn and in 1802, well before the calamitous smoke and smog of its later development. So, the city as monster, as great when, as William Cobbett famously put it, as distant volcano, urban jungle, or vast, terrible machine that eats people, indifferent and inimical to life, and in which our connection to nature is entirely lost. It's a nightmarishly familiar picture of what a city is, or might be, one that comes up again and again in literature, film, and visual art, from Lord of the Rings to Watership Down, Fritz Lang's Metropolis to Soylent Green and even Blade Runner, and from H.R. Geiger's nightmarish visions to the artist Paul Noble's dystopian cityscapes. And to me, it's a vision that speaks of trauma and fear. And yet, our profound anxieties about cities have stubbornly failed to come to pass. Thanks to everything from modern sewerage and sanitation to our inveterate love of back gardens, the Clean Air Act to the work of county wildlife trusts, from Greenbelt policies to pioneering conservationists like W.H. Hudson, Nan Fairbrother and Chris Baines, and from the Wildlife and Countryside Act to our long tradition of amateur naturalism, even the EU. Instead of ongoing urban degeneration, what we've actually seen is a process of transformation as cities become cleaner, their habitats are increasingly studied and protected, and more and more wildlife moves back in from foxes to fireweed, goldfinches to gulls. Yet it remains an orthodoxy that despite intensive farming practices, the countryside and nature remain synonymous, while the city is unnatural, even harmful to life. The writer, journalist and environmentalist David Nicholson Lord, who died last year, wrote in his book, The Greening of the Cities, about the legacy of these beliefs in our imaginations. He said, the classic urban notion of organism, a city being with its own unity and identity, persisted. Any greenfield development of housing or industry was, as it were, a spore of this organism, a kind of secondary cancer. The land taken was instantaneously bounded, ruled and unfree. From that remarkably influential tract, Britain and the Beast, published in 1937, to Ian Nairn's outrage of 1955, the theme persists and intensifies. 
The city, wrote Nairn, is today not so much a growing as a spreading thing, fanning out over the land surface in the shape of suburban sprawl. The emotional resonances touched off by this creeping and apparently inexorable corrosion of the countryside were increasingly striking. Land disappeared or vanished under concrete. Never, the implication was, to return. Countryside was desecrated, or more generally and ambiguously, spoilt. David Nicholson Lord quotes Ian Nairn there to illustrate a powerful imaginative theme in our ongoing relationship with cities. Open almost any newspaper or look online and you'll find its two strands. Urbanisation is an unequivocal and irreversible blight and experiencing nature means visiting the green fields and ancient woods of open countryside. But are these beliefs true? And what do they cost us? Because the fact is, there's no such thing as pure, untouched and unchanging countryside. And moreover, that countryside does not disappear under concrete, never to return. As conservationists now know, a wide range of habitats can be encapsulated as cities grow, coming together as a new kind of urban ecosystem, one made up of an ever-changing patchwork of habitats and ecotones, habitat boundaries, that are very often teeming with life. Yes, some animals move elsewhere, but many simply adapt. Peregrines nest on skyscrapers and hunt at night by streetlight. Orchids colonise alkaline waste tips. Flooded brownfield sites become home to wading birds, and dormant seeds germinate again when city soil is disturbed. What's more, issues like higher levels of nitrogen, 24-hour street lighting, litter and food waste, and the heat island effect, in fact favour a range of species, creating a welcoming habitat for many forms of life. Honeybees, for instance, are currently thriving in cities, thanks to their far lower levels of neonicotinoids. Cities may differ from the farmland most of us picture when we think of a natural environment, but only insofar as farmland differs from coastal areas, and coastal areas differ from heaths. I'm not saying that cities create no issues for wildlife whatsoever, of course not. But the soot-blackened and polluted metropolises of the past have long been consigned to history, and our imagined dystopias have not materialised. Cities, if we could just learn to see and take pleasure in them, are now richly various, deeply reward rewarding to engage with, and increasingly important for nature. It's time to leave behind the belief that, in terms of the environment, the countryside is good and the city bad. And here's why. In study after study, the evidence for the benefits of a life connected to nature is stacking up, from improved mental health to post-operative recovery, better childhood learning and behaviour to boosted immu immune response, 82% of us now live in built-up areas, which means that to access those benefits, we need to engage with the everyday urban nature all around us, rather than believing that rarities are all that's important, or that wildlife is something we have to get in the car and drive out of town to go and see. And it's not just about our own health and well-being, but about wildlife too. As Sir David Attenborough has said, no one will protect what they don't care about, and no one will care about what they have never experienced. To raise a new generation of conservationists and continue reversing the missteps of the past, it's vital that urbanites have a daily experience of nature. It's going on all around us in our cities, and it's glorious. All that remains is for us to tune into it. You're fast asleep. Face buried deep in your pillow, hair frowsty, dreaming of something half anxious, half stupid, that will evaporate within moments of you waking, which won't be for a while yet. All those hours that have ticked by while you lay there, all that living, busy night, so much has happened while you slept. But now the city, with its street trees and office blocks, bus garages and playing fields, terraces and ring roads, pivots one invisible inch towards dawn. And although it's still dark on your street and in all the maze-like streets around, something happens. It may not be the first that day, 
Because who can say when day starts or where? But it's the first you hear, although you won't remember it. A robin, awake for half an hour now, watchful and wary, has shaken out his feathers and flitted to the top of your neighbour's hedge. Now he opens his beak and flings out four questioning notes like a tiny angler casting into dark water. Lost in sleep's undertow, you turn over in bed. The robin cocks his head, listens, and tries again. This is how the day begins. A fox trots down the still dim pavement, hugging the wall, and slips left between bins. <coughs> Lightly, she scales a garden fence, neat paws placed perfectly, tawny brush up to balance behind. Fifty years ago, she wouldn't have been here, but now the city is as much home to her as it is to you, and though she may only hunt these streets for two years until a car takes her, it is testament to the city as a shared and living habitat that she is here at all. She is grace itself, slipping down and through back gardens to the unvisited shed beneath which two fat blue-eyed cubs squeak for her in a stink of musk and vulpine love. Sometimes she brings them things to play with, a baby's dropped sock, a takeaway fork. Today, though, she just suckles them, eyes closed in bliss. Above the shed, in the garden shrubs and scrappy sycamores and hedges, more and more birds sing. It begins to be light. The early sun gilds the topmost leaves of the city trees and coaxes them to a further degree of fullness. It wakes a bumblebee, the first of the day in your street. Dozily, it crawls from under a flower into the fullness of the sun's warmth and, uncoupling its wing muscles with an invisible shrug, begins to vibrate until it is warm enough to fly. Hymned now by birdsong, blackbirds, great tits, and thrushes repeating the catechism of their phrases, the bee lofts itself improbably into the waiting air and begins its day's work, buffeted only slightly by a backdraft from the first car of the day to pass your house. Your alarm sounds. Drugged with sleep, you silence it and squint, disbelieving at the daylit window through which shapes of birds cross the city sky. A gull drifting high with slow, white wing beats. A pigeon sculling towards its nest of squabs under the railway bridge. The dawn chorus is over, though all day, this being April, birds will sing. And as you get up and stumble to the bathroom, a gang of sparrows riots up your street playing tag in the hedges, bickering in back gardens, and finally settling as you blearily boil, boil the kettle to sit and gossip for a while. Less numerous than they once were, but starting to stabilise, they have been our neighbours for centuries. Yours nest all together in a backyard full of junk and mattresses and squabble over the cheap seed an old lady puts out each day. There's another flock a few streets away too, where a terrace of older houses still have the right kind of eaves. Here's what happens while you have breakfast. A peacock butterfly wakes from hibernation in a crevice by your front door. All winter it's dreamed there, where the wood is dry and split by years of sun. You've passed beneath it a thousand times, its dark underwings all but invisible in the little crack into which it crept last autumn. It was there over Christmas, and when you woke on New Year's Day. All spring it slept, waiting until the wood warmed up. And now, finally, it edges out on wirework legs and opens red wings to the sun, its two sets of eye spots blinking astonished at the world. It will dance off as you dress to seek out dandelions in verges and back garden grape hyacinths, and in three days' time will find a precious stand of nettles in the park on which to lay its eggs. Next year, you'll see one of its descendants there while walking a friend's dog, and then another... Their success in breeding here, recorded by local school kids for the big butterfly count, will be in part because park keepers ignored the letters and emails from some of your neighbours telling them to cut back all the weeds. 
People are leaving their houses to go to work now, stepping outside to a street thronged and thriving with life. Plants crowd the pavement cracks, grown from seeds blown in on particular breezes or deposited there by insects and birds. All the rose bay willow herb in your home patch arrived in the space of two days last summer when the wind changed direction and brought it here from the motorway embankment. A snapdragon that won't bloom for months yet was a garden escapee, while down towards the bus stop, a tiny rowan four inches high has taken root at the base of a street lamp. A red wing paused there two winters ago, a migrant from Scandinavia who had spent all day eating berries in a supermarket car park. He perched and shat, and although the little adventitious tree won't make it past the council's next round of weed killing spray, the space its roots have opened up at the base of the pole will be colonised first by a greater plantain with its flat, tough leaves cleverly evolved to withstand being walked on, and then by a busy colony of ants. A morning jogger, white earphones in, is heralded as she runs by birds. A wren shouts trills from a lilac that'll soon be in heady bloom. Goldfinches chirrup companionably from an ornamental cherry. A male blackbird, ink black with a yellow beak, carols down from next door's magnolia. With many more per city mile than in open countryside, this one will sing you out and back all summer, his lovely phrases rich proof of everywhere he's been and everything he's heard. Other blackbirds, a feisty robin he shared a garden with growing up, your mobile phone. Come August, he will be in malt, and then silent through the winter until next March. Having really noticed him for the first time this year, you'll find that you miss him. The sun opens the daisies on the verges and in the little parks passed through by commuters and dogs and prams. It warms the soil so that seeds germinate, their tiny cases cracking, white filaments reaching blindly out for water and life. Ants build cities, beetles are busy, worms slip through the soil unseen. And all the while, a billion, billion microbes multiply as diverse and as interconnected here as anywhere else in the world, turning dog shit and dead things and last year's leaves everywhere to good earth. All this happens as you log into your computer and open up the World Wide Web. It carries on happening through everything you do that day. The gardens in your street are part of a rich mosaic of territories that relate in no way at all to their nominal human-made borders. Cats, as we all know, keep them on permanent stakeout, but their green squares are also owned by birds whose overlapping songs advertise their tenure all through the breeding season, by rats who will defend their patch jealousy from competing clans, and foxes whose nightly beat will be several square miles in the countryside, but far less in the city, which is, thanks to our wastefulness, so very food rich. These maps of your street overlie one, in, one another like a palimpsest, their borders vital knowledge to your wild neighbours, if not to you. And now, as you put the kettle on, another of the locals sweeps in, a sparrowhawk doing the rounds of the gardens he has made his to hunt. He is surveying the nest boxes and bird feeders, checking flight lines and angles, roofs and roadworks and tree cover and scaffolding, adding always to the map of what you think of as your part of the city, a map he carries in his head and that is more richly detailed, more astonishing than you will ever know. He hasn't paired up yet. He's hunting alone, as he does for most of the year, and the fact that he's here is a miracle, really, because 30 years ago, sparrowhawks weren't found in our cities, and 30 years before that, it seemed a certain bet that we would lose them altogether. After the Second World War, to help boost our food production, we began not only to rip up ancient hedgerows and to stop leaving fields fallow over winter, but also to cover the countryside in pesticides that didn't break down and that accumulated in the bodies of insects and worms and all the animals and birds that ate them, growing ever more concentrated until our birds of prey went into sudden freefall because their eggshells couldn't hold and they couldn't breed. But in 1962, a woman wrote a book that changed everything. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring painted a grim picture of a future without birds and led to DDT being gradually banned in most of the developed world. Al Gore has said that she changed the course of history. 
And it's because of her work that a sparrowhawk swoops over your street now. And there are red kites doing recce over London and peregrine falcons hunting cities nationwide. There are kestrels hanging over our motorways and jewel-like hobbies catching dragonflies here each summer. And while we're still persecuting birds like the hen harrier in the name of sport, unforgivably, it's worth going over this. Because the reason that sparrowhawk will this year raise chicks in your postcode is that we understood something and we reversed a process and we brought the wildlife back. We can do that. We are doing that every day. Your lovely living city is proof. Not far from your house, there's a little nature reserve. Didn't know that? Look it up. I promise you it's true. Ask the dog walkers. They know every scrap of green space in the city. Ask the school children who are taken there on visits and allowed properly to explore and who revel in the fact that there are no signs telling them that everything's dangerous. That tiny green corner may not be a mountain or a glacial lake or an upland moor. There aren't postcards of it showing views at sunset or dotted with safely grazing sheep. Instead, it might be an old railway cutting, rewilded, or a bombed-out city plot. It could be a fragment of ancient wood on a hill too steep to build over, or a post-industrial waste tip. Either way, I'll tell you this. It's teeming with life, and it gifts that life to the city around it. Tawny owls and three kinds of bat, woodpeckers and butterflies, and perhaps even a badger set, hundreds of years old, a relic from when this really was all fields. If there's water, there'll be frog spawn and caddisfly larva, maybe a heron in the mornings before the traffic gets going, or even a kingfisher like a blue bolt unzipping the air. And the people looking after it, you can recognise them by their fleeces. They're a rare breed too, and relatively new to cities. It's only in recent years that we've had either the knowledge or the inclination to set aside places for urban wildlife and manage them in the way that we're doing now. That's why today, as the sun springs high over the city and your thoughts start to turn to lunch, there are people at work sowing wildflower seeds around housing blocks, checking nest boxes, planting native hedges along wing roads and recording urban bird counts. Their efforts, one of the reasons that our cities are home to wildlife as well as people now. And even if you never visit these precious protected oases, although really you should, you're part of what makes this process happen. Through the nature programmes you boost the viewing figures for, the green causes you support, the lectures you attend, and the groundswell of opinion you're all part of. A public mood that values nature now and that draws responses from politicians, town planners, and NGOs alike. So when you glance at the news websites, as you do while eating your lunch, and you see something about hedgehogs perhaps becoming extinct within your lifetime, and it brings you up short for a moment because you remember them from childhood, and surely they can't just go like that, can they? But you try to think when you last saw one, and you can't, and that familiar sadness comes over you, mixed with guilt and helplessness at everything we're losing. When that happens, think of those urban nature reserves, and think of your sparrowhawk, because the greatest threat to living things by far is believing that their loss is inevitable. It's a busy afternoon in your postcode now, and everything is happening. You wouldn't believe the industry. In the big tree you can see from your bedroom window, the annual caterpillar explosion is underway. Their juicy bodies, the ideal baby food for birds whose hatching is timed precisely to coincide with it. Great tits throng the branches, their calls pitched up to carry over traffic noise, while blue tits take advantage of their lighter weight and greater agility to hunt the outermost twigs. There are chaffinches too, and goldfinches once prized as cage birds for their striking plumage and lovely liquid song. Their numbers are on the rise in cities, not least because about half of us now feed the birds in our gardens, helping populations flourish that might otherwise struggle to cope with the eradication of seed-rich farmland weeds. It's not just birds that are busy. Tiny gall wasps, terrible at flying, have emerged from the hundreds of thousands of little brown disks that fell from the underside of that tree's leaves last September and covered the ground beneath. 
Now they're seeking out male catkins on which to lay their unfertilized eggs. There they will induce a round gall like a little red current to form. From these, a bisexual generation will emerge in June, mate, and lay eggs on the underside of the leaves again. This complicated and exotic life cycle will go on entirely unobserved while you make meals, watch TV, and maybe plan a week away somewhere lovely, somewhere you can really, you know, get back to nature. In the scrubby shelter belt of trees way over by the railway line, grey squirrels are busily unearthing the last of the treasure they buried last winter. Acorns, hazelnuts, watsits, snowdrop bulbs stolen from the back garden of a woman you sometimes pass in the street but whose name you do not know. Squirrels' memories are excellent, but not everything will be unearthed, and next year there'll be a few new seedlings in this tiny scrap of litter-blown wood, and three snowdrops, which will steadily spread. One squirrel lost half his tail in autumn in a dispute with a large black tomcat. And were you one of the commuters who stands at the station morning after morning, you might come to recognise him as he steals onto the platform, stop-start, stop-start, and pilfers from the bins. He sleeps in a mess of twigs in the crook of a poplar, safe from wind and marauding gulls. He sired two litters there last year and another a month ago. The scolding sound he makes when dogs or people pass below is like a duck being repeatedly strangled. The afternoon sky clouds over a little. Rain will sweep in from the west tonight, though for now the April afternoon remains dry. When the children begin to stream out of school, there is still enough hazy sun to cast their shadows on the day-warmed pavements and walls. Your eye passes over its patterns now, but much of the city's brick and stonework wears brooches of lichen in delicate and fashionable colours. A source of the organic matter needed by pioneer plants and home to tiny spiders and mites, these ancient and much-overlooked organisms don't just dot your pavements, but co cover a staggering 8% of the world's entire surface. Once almost entirely lost from our cities, poisoned by sulphur dioxide from coal fires and industry, our vastly improved air quality has seen them stage a return, and while traffic pollution does inhibit some lichen's growth, others actually thrive on it. Today, in the city's churchyards and cemeteries, the lichen runs riot, albeit very slowly. These unsprayed and often relatively undisturbed places are teeming with wildlife. Chiff chaffs and black caps, celandines, Spanish bluebells and wood anemones, slow worms basking on sun-warmed stones, and wood mice and field voles in the tangled undergrowth. And all over the city, Budlia is beginning to form the dangling fag-end flower spikes that will bloom purple in June and attract butterflies and hoverflies until October. Brought to the UK from China's stony hills in 1890 and planted in gardens, it soon began to naturalise, but its range really exploded after World War II, when large areas of exposed stone and rubble in cities from London to Liverpool, Coventry and Southampton provided the perfect environment for its wind-blown, lime-loving seeds. Now, Budley is everywhere, along railway embankments, on building sites, in gutters and chimneys, even sprouting optimistically from the side of buildings. Its nectar will feed peacock and tortoiseshell butterflies, red admirals and cabbage whites, moth caterpillars like the scalloped hazel and the mullein will eat the leaves, and little predators like spiders and ladybirds will complete this relatively new and entirely successful food chain. Proof that not every so-called invasive species is a matter for concern. Far from their one-time home of sea cliffs and stony islets, rock doves are congregating on the rooftops and strolling about between the afternoon shoppers' feet. Breathtakingly agile in flight, and with unrivaled navigational skills, feral pigeons come in a variety of colours, just like domestic cats, can breed monogamously all year round, and are the only type of bird that can suck. They are clever and hardy, and if familiarity has bred in you contempt, it should be remembered that their cousin, the passenger pigeon, was once the most numerous bird in North America, perhaps the entire world, with single flocks numbering in the billions. And in the space of a single generation, we killed them. 
every single one. How lucky those afternoon shoppers are to find themselves sharing a street with these dapper and resourceful birds. Not least because without them, we might also lose the peregrines and sparrowhawks that they have drawn to our urban areas. And then another opportunity would be gone for city dwellers to experience the acute sense of wonder an encounter with wild nature can bring. Gulls wheel and cry overhead, and the sun glints off the slow-slipping, wide-rolling river. It is five o'clock, and people are beginning to leave work. Cars stack up at the lights, and the one-way system begins to be busy. Couples take shortcuts through the city's parks, just because it's nicer to walk through a bit of green than on pavements. And in those parks, and beside the pathways, cow parsley is starting to come out, its odd fragrance seeming at this time of day to intensify, the banks of tall white froth giving off a rich, unsettling smell. Like nettles, cow parsley needs nitrogen to flourish, something it can get from car exhausts, and so it does well in an urban setting. The city has that warm, close feeling that precedes rain. Everywhere the trees and plants are busy transpiring and the buildings baffle breezes so the air in the streets stays sheltered and still. Light reflects off glass. Warmth escapes from homes and offices and rises from the tarmac and the traffic, keeping the city a few de degrees warmer than the countryside that surrounds it, something that helped get many of your wild neighbours through the winter. Now, on this spring evening, a thermal rises from the city centre, carrying up with it greenfly and spiderlings and all sorts of other aerial plankton. <coughs> Soon, swifts will arrive, flying in from Africa to spend the whole summer circling overhead and hoovering them up and screaming low over your street in the day-long day joyful dogfights that so characterise summer. Already on their way here, crossing continents while you go about your daily tasks, they eat sleep and mate on the wing, living in the endless air above you as a fish lives in water. When this year's fledglings take off in August from ledges and soffits and lost tiles on church spires and old buildings dotted around your city, they will not land again, even for a moment, for two, three, perhaps even four years. Over the centuries, swifts have really thrown their lot in with people, shacking up companionably with us in towns and cities around the world. In very recent times, their numbers have fallen, as our efficient new buildings tend not to let them nest. But a couple of years ago, someone on the other side of the city to you saw something about swift bricks on the TV and told someone who told someone whose partner designed social housing. And because the special nest bricks helped with their corporate social responsibility, they installed them in a tower block and put a story up on their website. And since then, there have been several newly swift-friendly sites in the city. This year, we'll see the first chicks. It's early evening now, cloudy and close. You've opened a bottle of wine and put the news on. Before long, the kitchen smells richly of cooking. Directly over your head, as you fetch knives and forks from the drawer, a blackbird takes up position on the ridge cap of your roof and begins his evening service. He's the same one who sang this morning from the cherry, whose particular notes you're starting to know. <coughs> His phrases end on a rising twist that makes you think of party ribbons. Dusk falls, and on the verges and in the parks, the daisies close their eyes while birds find roosts for the night. The rain is still an hour or two away, and bats are clearing the mosquitoes and aphids from back gardens and scooping up moths from around the streetlights. In an overgrown graveyard not far away, a solitary hedgehog shambles through damp, unmown grass and finds it thronged with slugs and snails, none of them, thankfully, poisoned with slug pellets. If you were to pass by right now and pause, you'd hear him crunching. And if you were walking in the gathering dusk, you might hear tawny owls calling. After a long absence, there's been a pair among the graves for the last few years now, occupying an owl box fixed to a tree by a local conservation group, part funded by the supermarket you shop at. Now, while you clear the plates and pour more wine in your warm and brightly lit home, an owl quarters the undergrowth at the back of the churchyard, 
stooping on silent wings to clutch a young rat not long out of its nest behind the church bins. Life and death is everywhere among the graves, and in the city's parks and gardens too. At last, it is fully dark, although the traffic will remain busy on the ring road all night long. The rain sweeps in, first a light drizzle that dampens the leaves of the street trees in your road and darkens the pavements, then something more set in. By the time you go to bed, it is coming down steadily. In a hedge, a couple of doors down from you, the blackbird's brown mate is brooding four speckled eggs. You'd think, if you could see her in the darkness, that she'd built her nest too small. With her neat tail cocked up, it looks as though she barely fits in there. But its snugness helps the eggs stay warm and dry, and the dense privet keeps most of the rain off her back. She is half sleeping, though now and again one eye glints. In a nearby tree roosts the male, murmuring almost inaudibly to himself with his beak closed in subsong. All four of their chicks will fledge, but a sleek young tabby will take two within the week where they sit side by side on the ground for comfort as they did in the nest. But the pair will raise another two broods by the end of summer. The world turns. You are deep in sleep now, dreaming of... I don't know what you're dreaming of. You are fathoms away. Mice, like tiny, quick, grey shadows, slip silently through spaces in the building you can't imagine, their world partly coinciding with yours and partly formed of places you will never see. They are working while you sleep, the hard work of staying alive, as the moths are working, as the nighttime foxes are working. You turn over in bed and sigh. Around you, the city, with its street trees and office blocks, bus garages and waterways, terraces and nightclubs, tips invisibly towards another day. And though it's still dark on your street, and in all the maze-like streets around, something happens. A robin, awake for a little while now, watchful and wary, shakes out his feathers and flits, flits to perch on a street lamp outside your house. He opens his beak and casts four questioning notes into the pre-dawn dimness, cocks his head to listen, and tries again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. That was absolutely fantastic. We've got some time for some questions or comments. Yeah, you probably know me from Twitter. Saskia, hello. hello. Um, I was wondering if that had been published anywhere. No, it hasn't. No, it was written especially for today. Oh, that was lovely. Thank you. Next question. Um, you. What um, is your topic of interest in, um, in your books? Uh, well, I'm a novelist rather than somebody that writes specifically about nature, but um, nature is a big part of my writing. I couldn't start something without... Yeah knowing what season it was, um, and also what kind of country I was in, um, countryside. Um, and I find, it hard to, I find it hard to write about people without understanding their relationship to nature, which, which may be that they don't have one, but um, it's almost like the, the baseline for, for everything that I write. Um, that's not so much deliberate, it's like... If it, it, I'm a tube, tube of toothpaste and you squeeze me and that's what's come out, you know, it wasn't a plan. That's just that's that's the way my writing comes out, and it's uh, I don't think I could change it now. Hello, I was wondering whether you'd grown up in the city, because you have a, a phenomenal sensitivity to nature, and I wondered if Thank you, you developed it in the city or in the country. Uh, I I grew up in um, semi-rural Surrey in the. Uh, late 70s and early 80s when it was um, it was possible to play outside all day by yourself it was possible to go outside in the morning and you came home when you were hungry um, I came from a big family there were six of us and you know we were kind of semi-feral children really um, when I moved to London when I was 21 I was uh, I lived in Dalston at first and which is not a very green area um, didn't, couldn't see any trees, didn't have any trees on my commute and became incredibly miserable. 
and didn't really realise why. I didn't really put two and two together at all. Um, and then went on a holiday to Devon, which is where we used to go as, as children, and I kind of had a big revelation. I just thought, this is, this is, this is what I need, and you know, I, I desperately need this back in my life. And moved to South London, which is where I live now, which is really green. And um, Clay was born out of um, almost an, ev an evangelism, really wanting to connect other people around me with this thing that I'd begun to notice and, and, and it was bringing me such joy and was making living in, in a city really possible um, where it hadn't been before. It had been very painful. Um, but I felt like, you know, when you are um, house hunting and you look around and you see estate agents boards everywhere because your filter at that time is houses and the rest of the time you don't notice them. And I felt like I'd changed my filter and I was noticing nature and it was so beneficial to me and I kind of wanted to to do that for other people and to say, look, you know, there's all this stuff. It's amazing. Look at it. You know, it's brilliant. And it will change your, you know, your, your, what you get out of being here. It will make it possible. Um, and also, it's important for, for nature as well to, to, to be aware of it and live in it and understand that, that we're part of it because that's how, you know, I think you, 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 you change things and you protect things through love, not, not through guilt. So I think, you know, if we all connect with very everyday urban nature, then we will protect it. And beyond that as well. Were you talking about your uh, interactions with these birds and animals in the city, and, and did they inspire you? Uh, in the piece that I've just read, yes, um, I was imagining a city which I which wasn't London and wasn't Bristol either. It was a sort of it was every city, um, but there are bits in there that. Uh, that I've experienced, like there's a photo that you, you hopefully saw of a sparrowhawk that was in my garden. And it was one of those moments of just, oh my God, you know, and, and Helen MacDonald's very good with this in, in H, H is for Hawk, where she talks about um, it being like someone's tipped a snow leopard into your, into your kitchen. You know, it's so wild, it's so extraordinary, you just can't take your eyes off it. And, you know, that, there's a lot of the, those kind of moments of connection and um, it's like a gift. It's a feeling of being taken out of yourself and... Um, it, can, it can transform your mood and transform your day to, to step outside yourself in that way and, and feel that there's a world that has nothing to do with you, actually. I, I find that very relaxing to realise that loads of stuff that's going on is going on for its own purposes and it doesn't really care about me at all. I think that's wonderful. Hiya, I'm Hi. Gavin from Twitter. Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm on Twitter. <laughs> I have been tweeting about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I noticed um, that... Um, you've also done a, some kind of record um, in conjunction with the book. Um, and I was going to ask you about this on Twitter, but I thought it would be better just to ask you tonight if you could maybe explain what that is and maybe the process that went into it, because it sounds really interesting. And you might want to just introduce, the, 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 this is the second book. Yes, yeah. yeah, this is um, oh, Hawthorne Time, which Thanks. is over there, um, which is the very handsome hardback. Um, and I have a friend who's a mu musician and um, he's somebody that I talk through a lot of book ideas with and, and he's a kind of sounding board for me. Um, and I can't tell you who he is because he needs to be anonymous for contractual reasons. But um, he had read an early draft of Hawthorne Time and he was um, kicking around looking for ideas at the time. And this woman here, Tanya Hirschman, in the second row, was giving me techniques for... Um, writing short stories and coming up with ideas and inspiration. And I took the ideas that Tanya taught me and gave them to him and said, why don't you make a track, based, you know, open my book at random, have a look, see what you find, make a song about it. And he came up with these two astonishing pieces of music that were so... You know, one of them just took me apart and I ended up going back to the scene and rewriting it because what he had written was much darker than the scene I'd written and I, it, it sent me back. Um, and uh, Jeff from Caught by the River was sort of swept in and gathered it up and said, right, we're going to put this out on vinyl. So uh, I have a very exciting 200 copies of a 10-inch record coming out with a beautiful sleeve by my artist friend, Lucy Murta, which is not here tonight, but you can order from Caught by the River if anyone wants. And it's going to be on um, Mary Ann Hobbs' breakfast show on Saturday morning. You all tune in. As you were talking, I was reminded of another book that uh, came to my attention in the last couple of years, Wild Hares and Hummingbirds, mm. obviously, and I'm sure a lot of people know Stephen it. Stephen Moss. Yeah. And I, 
Um, I, I felt that in that book and also in your talk, there is such a, um, a focus on birds. And birds, I think, are fascinating because of the fact that they, they trace these lines and lives that we can only imagine from the ground looking up. And in Wild Hairs and Hummingbirds, there's talk of them, the birds that don't come so far south or have been pushed further north by the changing climate and the changing environment. And in, this, in the city, in your piece, you're talking about the stabilization of some species, uh, how some species have come back because of the habitat and the, uh, the safety that is provided by certain spots. Yeah. And I was wondering, in your research, have you kind of, have you pulled together a, a vague idea of where, where the kind of bird population in any sense is? Because a lot of reports you see come out talk about the drop in birds, but you are giving a much more positive spin. So I was just wondering what you had found and um, possibly where you had found it. <laughs> uh, well, I was, I was concentrating on um, urban birds, which are... A lot of them, they're, they're not just urban, they pass through urban areas, so you know, they're, they're part of a bigger picture and, and they have um, more resources perhaps elsewhere in, in, their, in their wintering grounds. Um, it, is, it, it is a fact that birds are in trouble, many birds are in trouble, not all. Um, it is also a fact that we can turn that around quite easily by making some decisions and, and the, things that, the small things that we do, like feeding birds, you know, the reason goldfinches are up is because we're feeding birds. You know, we've done that, and that's, that's an easy thing that we can all do. Um, I think what I, what I worry about slightly is um, a situation where all of the messages are so negative that we all give up. And, you know, it's like I, I was saying in, in the talk, the moment we give up, that's when everything's really in trouble. And um, things are worrying, but they... Populations change over time through their own reasons as well. You know, um, you could say that the reason that swifts and swallows nest on, on buildings is because we interfered with their original habitats. You know, is it unnatural that they nest in, in, in cities? No, it's, they've been doing it for many hundreds of years, but their behaviour has changed, and, and populations and behaviours do change, you know, by themselves. Um, I'm not in any way denying... The, the massive drops, particularly in far farmland birds, but the message I want to take away regarding cities is that we can live with really good, um, stable and, and um, pleasing bird populations in cities if we, if we want, if we choose. I just wanted to point out the, the rather pleasing uh, symmetry and that many people would argue that humans have to live in cities if the world is to survive because it's much more ecologically sound. <laughs> So if your arguments are making the cities seem more attractive rather than driving in and out from the country, that seems like a really nice thing to be doing. So thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Yes, 82% of us now are in, in urban areas. So, you know, I think if we persist with this idea that cities are dreadful, then that's, that's not really helping anyone, really. Just wanted to know, are you a dog walker? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. And that was one of the ways in which I really connected with green spaces around me as well, I was getting a dog. So it really gets you out there. You have to, you know, you, dog needs walking. So suddenly you're out there and you, you because you, it's a daily thing, you're seeing things in all weathers and seeing how they change day to day, which is, yeah, it's, it's quite life-changing that. Also, she's lovely. She's really nice. <laughs> do, you, do you think the idea of a London National Park will ever come to fruition? Ah, oh, yes. Daniel Raven Ellison. I think it's a fantastic idea. I think it's... Um, Particularly imaginatively, I think it's, it's very powerful to imagine the city as one um, kind of like an, an organism, like I was talking about with Ian Nairn, but a, but a positive one, rather than this idea of this sort of cancerous growth. You know, to link everything together and see it as blue and green, which, it, it, you know, it's something like 80% of London's blue and green, is that right? Something like that. Um, I think it, it, it's quite transformative. You know, how much... Um, Immediate practical difference it would make on the ground, I don't know, but I think the ripples of that could be quite, really quite powerful. And he's got so much energy, this guy that's driving it through. Yeah, I think it's, it's great. This is Bristol 2015. It's European Green Capital, and we're about, partly about, uh, you know, enhancing urban spaces. What, what kind, and also Bristol Green Capital is about behaviour change. What, mm. What's the best change that someone can make, do you think, to make cities much more wildlife friendly? 
something I think is very, very important is the idea of having a home patch, um, which is uh, it, it's an <coughs> idea of um, parochialism, but in a really um, positive way, which is something that Patrick Kavanagh, the poet, believed in very strongly. That um, I, I have, can't remember the quote exactly, but it was he said, oh, um, a, a, "A rock surfacing a narrow road, a stream, a gap in a hedge—that's as much as a, a man can know in his lifetime." Or words to that effect. And I think that if you can connect people to your garden, if you have one, your street and the trees in your street, your route to the bus stop, whatever the things are you see in that little home patch, and you become emotionally invested in that, that's when people petition the council and say, please don't cut down this tree, it's because their child has climbed that tree or they have noticed that there's a nuthatch nest in it. And it's that, that connection and that noticing that will protect these places and will also drive um, developers to build and, and develop sites in, in a way that's, um, that's good for us because we are telling them that nature is good for us. And, you know, that's, that's what I want. I want. I want you all to really give a shit about the little area where you live. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you. Melissa Harrison, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.